Welcome to Half Hour of Heterodoxy, featuring conversations with scholars and authors and ideas from diverse perspectives. Here's your host, Chris Martin. Sheila Heen is my guest today. She's the co-author of Difficult Conversations, How to Discuss What Matters Most, published in 1999. It was a New York Times business bestseller and has continuously been in print since then. Its 10th anniversary edition, which included an update, came out in 2010. She's also the co-author of Thanks for the Feedback, the Science and Art of Receiving Feedback Well, also a New York Times bestseller. She's also a lecturer at Harvard Law School. We mostly talk in this episode about difficult conversations between faculty and students, and this is the first of two episodes featuring Sheila. We recorded this using Skype because of technical problems with the application we normally use, so you may notice the audio quality is not as good as it normally is. Hi, Sheila. Thanks for joining us on the show. Delighted to be here. So let's start with your book, Difficult Conversations. What counts to you as a difficult conversation? (laughs) Well, we kind of went with the simplest answer, which is that if the conversation feels difficult to you, it counts, right? So if it's keeping you up at night, if you feel stuck, like I'm just not sure how to approach this conversation, or sometimes that means I didn't expect it to be a difficult conversation. It went in a direction that I didn't expect, and now I can't quite let go of it right? I'm, I'm dwelling on how it went and what I should have said, etc. Often they involve strong disagreement. Um, often then strong emotion follows that. Um, and sometimes there's also history in the relationship. Um, probably the biggest proportion of them happen in ongoing relationships, whether those are personal relationships or professional relationships. And you mentioned that individual differences are something that people should consider when they're thinking about conversations as difficult or not difficult. Um, Tell me a bit about the research behind that and how people can get perspective on when a conversation is difficult for the person you're talking to, even if it's not difficult for you. Mm, Yeah, well, so there are a couple of um, aspects to that. One, really, we stumbled upon while we were writing Thanks for the Feedback, which was some evidence um, that individual sensitivity to feedback or to any outside stimulus, meaning how upset do you get and how long does it take you to recover if we're talking about a negative trigger or in terms of positive feedback, like how happy does that make you and how long do you sustain that kind of bounce in your step? Some evidence that individual sensitivity can vary by up to 3000%. And so then we're in relationships with each other, reacting to each other, but the range of our reaction and the duration of our reactions to each other, um, there's just a huge set of differences. And I think, I think most of us know this instinctively. We've noticed it, that there are people in our lives who overreact is how we would describe it to everything. Right. Or there are other people in our lives who are incredibly insensitive. Um, so we've, we take ourselves sometimes as normal and any variation as somehow wrong in one direction or another. Um, So that's part of it. Part of it is just wiring. And the other part of it, I think, is has to do with identity. It has to do with the story we tell about who we are and what this situation suggests about us, right? Am I the good person here or the bad person? Am I competent or incompetent? Um, Am I lovable or worthy of love or respect, maybe in the professional world. Um, And if that feels like it's at stake, then the conversation is suddenly not just about whatever topic we're talking about. It's also about who I am and how I'm seen by other people, but also by myself. So when it comes to academia, um, if you're doing research in an area like political science or history, You may have even gotten into those topics because you're fascinated by things like war and violence and trauma, um, depending on your research area. And so some of our listeners find that even though they're fascinated by these areas, some students find them triggering or traumatic um, and are puzzled by this dynamic. And 
I think it is difficult because if you're an academic or if you've just read history out of personal interest, you know there have been terrible wars and um, people have just been pretty terrible to each other throughout history. Um, so how do you suggest professors uh, talk about issues like war and genocide and trauma? Yeah, it's it's such a, a conundrum or, or maybe it's a dilemma. In other words, often students are signing up for courses, partly because of their personal history and wanting to find some answers and some ways in which they can, in that field, start to make a contribution to change things. Um, And then the topic of the course itself, um, or some of the things that we need to discuss, are really hard, right? They're, They're not making it up that you know, they're filled with adrenaline and anxiety and that some of them are in fact experiencing some PTSD reactions. And to actually conduct the class and have the learning, um, that's what the class is about. Um, So, you know, I teach at a law school and in law school in particular, our job is to equip law students and later lawyers with the ability to shift perspectives and see all sides of an issue and also to be able to respond to arguments um, or ideas or values or accusations in the moment. So there's a way in which maybe in law school in particular, the fact that you're triggered in class is part of the learning, which is how do you, even though you've got adrenaline, (laughs) going because you've just been cold called right um, or someone else just said something incredibly wrong or offensive etc how do you respond um and and also see that person with some compassion um and empathy and openness to learning something that you didn't understand about their point of view and i think that's the dilemma that all of us are wrestling with these days um in both public and private discourse, but also, of course, then in the classroom. So are there any classroom exercises you like to use to help with this? Well, it's a great question. Um, Partly for me, it's being as transparent as I can be with the students about why we're doing what we're doing and what the purpose is. I find that often students are more open to tolerating the discomfort if there, it, we don't have an assumption between us that discomfort shouldn't exist in the classroom, but that it, when it does, it has a it has a purpose. It has a purpose that is intended to benefit them, um, and that we're all noticing and acknowledging that the impact isn't equal on all students in this classroom, um, but that. The com- it's the combination of me trying to be transparent, like my job. So I teach negotiation, right? My job is to help you be able to manage negotiations when they get really difficult and difficult conversations. And there isn't a way I can do that for you unless we actually put you into difficult conversations and cases where you actually feel the difficulty and get some practice managing it and building your skill set right at the edge of where you feel you're able to cope and operate. So I think that the it's the combination of me trying to be transparent about why we're doing what we're doing and what its purpose is that benefits them, combined with that happening inside of a relationship between us, right? That my students at least have a sense that I think I'm well-intentioned. Um, And that I care about them and I care about the struggle. Um, And that's sort of the road that we need to navigate together. So maybe that's the third piece of the puzzle, which is to say, I'm not going to have all the answers. I'm not going to make the right judgment calls all the time. There are going to be mistakes that I make and things that I don't see or understand. I'll say the wrong things sometimes. And so will you. And that's the task for us collectively here um, to sort of navigate all of that together and maximize the learning for you. So if students come to the classroom with this perception that the world is 
easily uh, divided into people who are good and evil or morally right or morally enlightened or morally unenlightened. Yeah, each of which Do has you a Twitter that? account. Yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry, go ahead. Each of which has a Twitter account. <laughs> right, right. Um, how do you get students with that attitude? I mean, there's some evidence that maybe a certain subset of very young students right now or students in iGEM are even more politically sensitive. Um, how do you get students like that to understand that in the longer term, there is a purpose to learning about a range of views and that to some degree you should trust the instructor because they probably do have a purpose in mind that you'll figure out later on? Mm -hmm. Um, there are a couple of things that have been helpful to me on that front. W one is just to talk about that tendency, which is that it's sort of our brain, the easiest thing for our brain to do is to categorize people into the good people and the horrible people. Oddly enough, the good people always tend to be present on our side <laughs> and the horrible people are on the other side. But that that sort of black and white view isn't really reality. And, and the way that I tend to come at it simply because of what I'm teaching is to have them first think about it for themselves, that in their most challenging conversations, in their real relationships, often there are things they've contributed to the problem. You know, they didn't treat a friend as well as they wish they had. They, It's true that the memo or paper they turned in could have been better and that they procrastinated probably longer than they should. And that doesn't mean that they're a bad person. It just means that there's something for them to learn. So I'm actually having them reflect on themselves and to get out of the tendency to see ourselves as either black or white. Obviously, this is all related in part to Carol Dweck's work on fixed mindset, like I'm smart or not smart, etc. And how I am is how I am versus a growth mindset, which is I'm more complex and I'm constantly evolving. And so I'm, I'm first having them think about themselves a little bit differently. And then I'm in a better place to remind them that the other people in the room and in this debate um, are also more complex than just this issue or set of arguments. Um, and maybe the second thing is that I tend to ask a pair of questions with some regularity, which is what's wrong with what they're saying? which is what, of course, we all jump to, right? We're listening for what we can rebut. But to follow that with, and what might be right about what they're saying? And that, particularly as an advocate, um, but also as a learner and a person in relationship with everybody else in your life, listening for what other people are right about, even when we think they're 90% wrong, actually has us is part of what helps us have a richer conversation. So there's also the problem of some people, and this this is not, maybe not such a problem in academia, but in real life, people who are Machiavellian or high in what psychologists call psychopathy, which is not mm -hmm. serial killer psychopaths, but people who appear to be very empathic, but actually have very little empathy for you. So they're very good at fooling you. So if you're trying to cultivate this habit of being good at conversations, uh, good at difficult conversations and good at listening, how can you also be careful about being manipulated? That was not where I thought you were going to end that question. Um, <laughs> where did you think it was going? I suddenly thought you were going to flip it and say, how do you not become manip manipulative, which is... Oh, well, that's also a good question to answer. It's a, it's a question that sometimes we get, which is that I'm helping students think about what influences other people. And then they say, well, but what if I use this for bad purposes? You're, are you teaching me to manipulate other people? Um, and my response to that is, if you were just doing it to get your way, and you don't actually care about their interests, or the ongoing relationship, etc. Um, it's possible that that will work for you for a couple of rounds, but they're going to catch on pretty quick if you're not authentic about it. Now let's flip to the other side, which is the question that you actually asked, which is I now suspect that this person is just trying to manipulate me. 
And I think that when we feel frustrated by someone and we wonder whether they're really operating in good faith or they're a good person or they really care about us and care about what we're saying or they're just pretending to, um, it's, I think we're a little bit quick to jump to the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis for what's wrong with them. And sometimes, some small percentage of the time, you probably know the percentages, um, that might be true. More often, they're just so busy trying to get their point across, or they just don't yet have the capacity to fully understand or the, the experience to fully understand what we're trying to say or what our experience is. And so it could be not a failure of sort of ability as much as a failure of skill or capacity right now, temporarily, meaning over time, they may come to understand something more fully or in a more nuanced way that we're trying to get across to them. And I, I don't know, I, I find that there are times where I'm in an argument with someone and I'm really clear about what they're wrong about and what they really don't get about what I'm saying. And then if I fast forward four or six months, if we assume it's an important issue between us, looking back, I actually do have a better understanding of where they were coming from. But in the moment, it was really hard. And it's taken me time to see what they're trying to help me see. Is there a concrete example that you can share that's not too personal? Um, I think if we want to talk about conversations about race, it's always hard for us to understand what it has been like to grow up and to live in the world as someone who has different characteristics, who the world reacts to and makes assumptions about. So it doesn't have to be race, right? It's just that race is a particularly loaded and complex topic for us. Um, but it can be, you know, growing up in your family versus my family. And what that led me to expect and understand and react to now. Um, and the more we get to know people, I think the more we start to understand, oh, yeah, I can see why that is such a big deal for them and why that was even harder than I think I appreciated. Is that helpful? Yeah, that's helpful. I'm curious about your thoughts on this front. On the issue of race in particular or just in general? Race in particular, or also just the sort of the axis of time between us. I think sometimes we analyze a conversation or exchange or a class as a short term moment in time or hour when, particularly as teachers, part of what we're doing is planting seeds that are going to take time to really take root. Um, mm -hmm. And it's hard for us to predict how they're going to take root and grow or not, um, because we just don't have a very clear view of the soil, right? That we're mm -hmm. so sowing into, and it's super varied in the classroom. But I'm just curious about your thoughts and reactions and experiences on this front. Well, when it comes to the classroom, I have actually only taught a class on the science of happiness, which actually covers a lot. It covers Gottman's work on relationships, for example, and yep. work from organizational psychology. So it's not the traditional positive psychology course that's really just focusing on character strengths and hedonic definitions of happiness. Um, and it's been fulfilling to see student feedback. But the, I think one of the things that's just challenging about being an academic is you see this feedback at the end of the semester, but that's probably not representative of the feedback or of the impact or lack of impact your course has two years down the road, which no one can really predict. And there's no mechanism that allows you to get feedback from two years in the future, unless occasionally a student will write to you two years later and say, thank you for teaching me this course. Right. It's had an impact on my life, which is really fulfilling, mm, which happens rare, once in a while. Right. But yeah, so you don't really know. I think that that issue of time can be different. Um, I mean, it's definitely the, the teacher-student relationship is definitely different from the spousal relationship, because in that mm. relationship, you really get to know someone over time. So once you've gotten to know them, hopefully, uh, hopefully, <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. hopefully or not, um, it varies. But when you do, you know, you have a sense of what their values actually are. Mm. And when it comes to students, you're dealing with people with very diverse values, values that are different from yours. Um, 
So I do think that when it comes to talking to students, I try to be receptive. So for example, I change the way I talk about religion a little based on feedback I've gotten from students because I realized they were interpreting secular humanism differently when I was teaching about it mm. than, um, than I had hoped for. They interpreted it as extremely critical of religion. Um, and uh, so I do take feedback into account. At the same time, I have had students say, uh, like one of the students who did think I was a little too critical of religion um, came back later and said, now I see things differently, and I see why maybe that was necessary to include in your course, which was also unexpected. So, um, I mean, overall, I'd say just the structures of academia are different. So it's very difficult, if not impossible, to know in the long term what impact your course is having. I, I suppose if you get really bad feedback semester after semester, then you should probably change something. <laughs> Perhaps. Well, I, so... I think that part of the st structure that's built into academia also doesn't serve us well in terms of our own learning. So first of all, if we expect students to learn, I think we have to model that ourselves, that we need to show the students that we're learning something from them. And then we're more likely to have them be open, even when they're skeptical, perhaps. Um, but the, the second structural aspect is the kind of feedback that we get. So course evaluations are just that they're evaluations. They're assessing based on some set of expectations of what I hope to get from this class, whether I got what I hope to get and how I felt about it. And partly that they also just have, they are, they reflect how entertaining you were as a teacher. Totally. Um, totally. Like, did I look forward to going to class or did I dread it? Um, how painful was it over time in terms of both the workload and the class attendance? It, so in Thanks for the Feedback, we talk about three types of feedback and evaluation rating or ranking based on some set of expectations or criteria is the easiest to collect, whether that's online or in course evaluations, but it's actually the least helpful in terms of our own learning. Um, what you really want to be doing is collecting two, the two other kinds, which is appreciation and coaching. So appreciation um, is sort of, do I see you? Do I get you? Do I notice the effort that you're putting in? It's a big piece of what makes life um, sort of satisfying and relationships satisfying. If we want to talk about marriage, it's a big piece of what is going on where spouses feel taken for granted or not. Mm -hmm. um, and then coaching is anything designed to help you get better. So students get a lot of coaching from us, right? Comments on their papers, etc. And then at the end of the term, they get a grade, which is evaluation. What happens for us as teachers is that we wait around. And then after the course ends, we collect evaluation, which actually often is hard to interpret in terms of, okay, well, what, what was it that could have been better? And so there's no reason that we have to wait around and have that be the only feedback that we get. So when we were working on the Thanks for the Feedback book, and by the way, that those three kinds of feedback, appreciation, coaching, and evaluation, we didn't make that up. Actually, it comes from a book called Getting It Done by Roger Fisher, Alan Sharp, and John Richardson. Um, and um, when we were working on that chapter, I decided, I think, in, for the first time in a more structured way to actually use this in my classroom. So I handed out index cards to everybody about halfway through the term. And I said, you know, on the index card, just write down one or two pieces of coaching for you know, if it were possible, what's one or two things we could do to make this class experience even more valuable for you um, in terms of your learning? So I collected all the cards and then I went home and I read them and a night of heavy drinking followed because um, <laughs> it was like, you know, 75 ideas for what I could change, which suggests that I'm, you know, because every piece of coaching also suggests a little bit of evaluation like about whether this class is good to begin with or not. And I realized actually that I needed the appreciation in order to hear the coaching. So 
the next term, I changed what I did. And when I handed out the index cards, I said, okay, on one side, write down one or two things you particularly appreciate about this class. And on the flip side, one or two things that if we could change them, they would help your learning. And those cards actually were incredibly helpful because they, once I knew that they saw how hard I was working to make, you know, their learning as deep as possible, then I could hear the suggestions and ideas that they had. And I didn't feel compelled to follow all of them, but I could come back and say, you know, say you guys had some really good suggestions. Here's a couple things that we're going to implement right away. And that's modeling a kind of openness that I think, um, we don't talk about as much as we should maybe in academia. I mean, we think of teaching as a negotiation. So I'm negotiating for students' engagement and willingness to take risks, to raise their hand, to say things, to hang with us when the going gets tough, um, to be willing to fail and self-reflect on that. And if that's what I'm negotiating for, well, I'm going to have to lock my own talk and model that in how I teach. Um, and I think it counters that who's the smartest person in the room sort of vibe that often underlies academia. One thing that I found good about the modern era or the era we are, we are living in is that with cell phones and electronic tools, it's, it's a lot easier to get feedback. So you don't necessarily need to use paper forms. Say more about what, how you would do that. Uh, I use something called Poll Everywhere. It's polleverywhere.com. Uh, there's some special features you can get with a premium account, which I don't have, but it's just a very easy way to do a single question or, um, or two question survey and get the results right there. So for some class discussions, it's useful because you can actually present the results that you just got from a discussion question, but it's also useful for something like evaluations, because in that case, you can ask a single question, uh, not show the results to the whole class, but record the results. And it normally takes about three or four minutes of class time. So I use that for a mid-semester evaluation. That's awesome. And so I would then just be thoughtful about the question I'm using because an evaluation question is the easiest one that people think of to jump to mind. I'm reminded mm -hmm. of an app that was developed for leaders where they can tap um, team members to get some feedback. And what the app developers were finding is that people were starting to use it and then not using it over time, that the engagement was falling off and they were wondering about why that was. And I said, well, what does the app ask? And it asked, how am I doing? Which is an evaluation question. And if I get three stars right. out of five, it doesn't tell me anything about what my people want from me or what I should change. So the question just needs to really be a coaching question or an, or an appreciation question, maybe a combination, but mm -hmm. you know, what could I do that would make a difference to you is going to get much more useful answers, whatever the mechanism. So I'm curious what questions you're using that you found more and less helpful. I mean, in addition to of course, polling that is about the content of the class and that's obviously driven by what you're trying to teach. Yeah, the question I've been using so far, which is now in retrospect inferior to the one you just suggested, is comment on anything that you think has been going well, anything that you think has been going badly. Mm -hmm. So I've not said evaluate me or evaluate the course, more just what has been going well, what has been going badly. Um, but I think the way you have put it is better because that actually mentions the student. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also you want to signal to students that I'm assuming that you do have comments rather than if you must. <laughs> right. <laughs> like it's it's an exception if you have a comment to make rather than I assume you do because we're we're all in this together. So, you know, list one thing you appreciate and one thing, one suggestion or idea you have says to them I expect that everybody has some. And so when I've learned not to say, if you have any feedback for me, if I just assume they do, I actually get more engagement and participation. 
All right. Well, we have to wrap up part one, and I look forward to talking to you in part two of this interview. But thank you for joining us today. It was a total delight. You can, of course, find difficult conversations at any bookseller. You can also find a small group study guide and a two-page preparation sheet for any specific difficult conversation you're about to have at stoneandheen.com backslash book hashtag difficult conversations. As always, if you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review on iTunes because it helps other people find out about the show. You can reach me at podcast at heterodoxacademy.org, and you can follow me on Twitter at chrismartin76. Thanks for listening. This podcast is produced by Heterodox Academy. Find us online at heterodoxacademy.org, on Twitter at HDX Academy, and on Facebook.